So no, electricity was never thought of as power in the airplane. I remember we got our first extension cord down in the ice. We were so happy to have, have uh, lights and uh, old Herman Nelson to run. Good morning, everybody. The sun, it's 10 a.m. The sun is just peeking up. It, uh, this time of year, it will come up a little bit and then go back down because at the top of the world, we don't get that much sunlight. In fact, if you go farther north, places like Inuvik, the sun doesn't come up. Uh, yeah, folks, it is cold. It is minus 34 degrees Celsius, which is like pretty much the same in Fahrenheit. It must be like 30 degrees in Fahrenheit. Minus 40 is where they actually connect. But I'm out here braving the cold, the Electra enhancing the audio today. Well, at least the ground power unit. So today, folks, I want to switch gears just a little bit in the beginning and talk about something huge that happened in the form of aviation. It's actually a very controversial thing, especially for someone like me who grew up around radial engines, but the first all electric commercial aircraft just flew. I just watched it on Instagram. Get her up, big dude, get her up. Our friends down in Harbor Air in Vancouver, BC, in fact, Richmond, BC, just took off, uh, which is a huge point in history, folks. De Havilland Beaver, made in Canada, 700, 750 horsepower electric engine. Yeah, this is huge news, folks. Um, I don't know too much about the airplane. In fact, this might be the first time you're even hearing about it, which to me is a shame that if someone, regardless of what you think about electric aircraft, someone has the guts and balls to, to put it all together uh, this should be headline news folks but you get what you get the aircraft did a circuit landed everything looked very very cool uh, so I want to send a congratulations to everybody at Harbor Air uh, for all the hard work and dedication uh, it's a long road to certification I think they're planning to certify the aircraft in 2021 uh, so by then hopefully the battery technology will be a little bit better because I believe the battery, I could be wrong, I think the battery in that aircraft is 2,200 pounds, but we all know batteries will get better in time. So I want to say a huge congrats to everybody in uh, at Richmond and Harbor Air for a magical day in Canadian and world aviation. Regardless of what you think, uh, it's a big step. So let's go back inside and warm up. I can't really feel the finger or my fingers and I'm losing my breath, folks. It is cold, but I do this for you. We'll see you inside. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 33 of Flame Savers! Well folks, just starting to warm up. It is crazy, crazy cold outside and a little bit early too. This is only like the first, you know, the end of the first week of December, beginning of the second week of December. It's supposed to be pretty warm, um, but uh, you know, luck is having. Hopefully we can get all this cold weather out of the way because February is when it's supposed to be super, super cold. Look at that. We were just talking about one of the most modern airplanes in the world with the the, turb or the electric beaver and then here with the Fokker. As you can see, there's a huge mess here. So while we were doing a live stream, um, Chucky and Benjamin were actually paint stripping the frame. Because you can remember on an earlier episode, long time ago, Stella was sandblasting. And sandblasting wasn't too efficient for us um, up in Yellowknife here. Uh, and it wasn't working, we didn't have the right machines and you know, kind of left it be. So, but we have to get the frame stripped. So instead of, uh, you know, sandblasting at minus 34 degrees Celsius outside, we're gonna take off the main root layer with uh, paint strippers. So Chucky and Benjamin uh, worked on that uh, on the weekend. So they did a mighty fine job. Um, speaking of work on, on it, uh, a whole bunch of new subscribers. There's a lot of you guys, and I know you're here to check out the the fox moth, where the fox moth here is getting cleaned up a bit, and you can kind of see. Look, my father's got the door. Remember the do door uh, from his story time. Benjamin's there. Hey, Benjamin. Hello. Working on the C46 elevator, and uh, there we go. So look, so they're getting the parts all. Uh, sorted out and it's cleaned up a bit um but uh 
Yeah, there's some holes in the floors. The weird thing about this aircraft that I noticed uh, that hopefully uh, maybe when Dan's back, he can explain a little bit to us, but uh, there's no frame like the Fokker. Uh, it's like wood and then the plywood. So like the plywood and the, the wood is like the frame. I don't know if this is correct, but it definitely looks like it. You can see underneath the fabric, it's got a wooden skin. So it looks like one big kind of exoskeleton kind of thing. So very neat. We're going to learn a lot more about this airplane. So um, yeah, let's go find my father and see if uh, you guys had some questions and some stuff about the history of this exact airplane. Okay, so we're back in my father's office. Uh, if you've seen the last couple episodes, uh, we've seen the airplane arriving, the Fox Moth. We've seen uh, really, really episode everyone really loved is why my father loved the Fox Moth going back to the days where he actually, it was his playhouse where it crash landed on a, a broken ski on landing and they actually used a dog team to bring it to where my father was living. My grandfather would put my father in the Fox Moth as a safe place for blasting. Go check out that episode. But today, uh, people are asking, where did this airplane come from? What's the history of the airplane that we have? Uh, so let's uh, let Joe talk. Yeah, well, this this is the airplane that we got in the hangar. It's DIX out of uh, Lac La Bonnie, Manitoba. And how I found out and learned about this airplane is I, I phoned this Henry Blondje about, because um, I'd heard he had a, a fox moth, but as soon as he heard me on the phone, he turned me over and we started talking Norseman parts. And he had a part of a Norseman that I needed, which was ventral fin. And so during his conversation, this is 25 years ago, he told me of his uh, fox moth. And so he, um, his son works here now, and his other son brought it to me. And Henry's come up every year and done a spring work on my Norseman. And every year we talked, for 25 years, we talked about getting this fox moth out of his garage, out of, Yell out of uh, Lac La Bonnie and Yellowknife. And so there's a picture what the airplane looked like back in that time. And there was a, an article I had on the airplane there, DIX. Oh, so it's really in the article here. Yeah, th this is DIX and, and it tells me what size floats to put on it. it tells me the whole story on, the, on, the, on this airplane. So I have a lot of history on this DIX. And uh, so, you know, I told Henry, I said, you know, we're going to take this airplane, y'all, and you're going to get a ride in it before, uh, you know, before we're going off that big air service in the sky in about 50 years from now. So anyway, in, in the interim, I got to take Henry for a ride, or he'll take me for a ride. It's his airplane, I guess I'll be, I'll be the passenger. But anyway, uh, we're really excited about getting it ready to fly because the fox moth has been such a part of our life and y'all knife uh, for uh, well my total life has been uh, centered around fox moths um, stories from my dad who would, when I was growing up wanted to learn to fly if I talked about airplanes dad would always refer to this Gordy Wanacott and the fox moth so he had no flying background but he could relate to me by telling me Gordy Wanacott stories of Gordy flew the Norseman and the fox moth and so, what I'm, I'm doing is this Gordy Wanacott, who was a pilot, he come from a farm around uh, Drossen, Alberta, from what I remember my dad telling me. And if there's anybody out there knows the family of Gordy Wanacott, that's him right there beside my dad, uh, beside a Norseman at Gordon Lake, and that's me back here trying to sneak in the airplane, but I can't get in and see me. So, I'd ask anybody who knew Gordy Wanacott's family, or his relatives, they could uh, contact me by that internet stuff, and I'd sure like to uh, talk to them. Because this airplane, when, I, when I'm finished, um, I'll probably, get, like each airplane, lots of times is dedicated to some person. But I'd like to dedicate this one to the Gordy Wanacott, who I heard about all my life. In fact, he was, um, you know, my dad always talked, he had a, a DFC from uh, flying, Spitfires and Mustangs and Hurricanes and looked like I looked him up one time. He was a um, he was a squadron leader in Evan 414 squadron. So I'd really like to know more about him. But anyway, that sort of instilled uh, and the moth in my head 
in my mind or in my soul. And uh, the other thing is, I, I'm very, very much want to get Henry Vaughn J, who had the airplane, back to Yellowknife in the spring. And uh, hopefully we can fly the airplane and, and fulfill a lot of our, our thoughts with it. So um, I, I very much uh, like to thank, and many people know Henry Blonje from Manitoba. He's very well known, and uh, people would appreciate the fact that I have his airplane because he'll help put it together in the spring. So there we go. So uh, it's a little bit of history course. We're going to learn more about the history. So Gordy Wanacott. Uh, there you go, internet people. If you can find that, Joe will probably send you a very special gift if you could dig up some information and stuff, because this is basically your uh, pilot hero growing up. Yeah, he was one of them. I remember my dad telling me one time that, uh, you know, my dad was a young man at the time. He said when Gordy passed on, he, he, he didn't make it through a water accident, a drowning accident, and he said he always wished he had gone and, and spoke to his father. But uh, he said, you know, it's always going to be next time, next time, next time. And pretty soon there was no next time. So uh, I might be able to uh, uh, sort of fulfill that too. So um, just for people to put this in perspective, what years would it have been flying in the north? What years are we talking about? Well, uh, Wanakot and my dad flew around in the late 40s and 50s. They were prospectors, they were diamond drillers, they were high grade gold. They, they made their living uh, you know, just as free, free men in the bush, they had uh, these Norsemen and Foxmouth to fly around and, and prospect and sell claims, and and uh, they were high grade in gold is how they were living, you know, which is a very good, good way to, you know, like in the Yukon they pan for gold nuggets. In our country, we high grade gold from rock, so they're high graders. And uh, I heard many, many stories from the old miners around here about how they, you know, they were very well known, very well liked. And uh, so I'd really like to, to um, make a tribute of this fox moth to, the, to that era of people. Sounds good. Okay, so quickly before we go, because uh, we're going to learn a lot more about all this stuff, folks, of course. Um, your connection to the electric airplane that flew today will book in this episode. First off, what's your thoughts on an electric beaver flying today for the first time? Well, it's a it's a, a complete turnaround of the stamp. I mean, um, we're talking now. They're putting the big buildings in Yellowknife back on the wood, and and they're going to be heating uh, the the old hospital in Yellowknife with with a bird wood burner now. And at the same time, I'm listening to the uh, the Beaver taken off with electric engines. So there's the world. Uh, World's well, a little tipsy turvy? No, no, it'll, it, it'll always spin good. It'll spin good. An uh, electric airplane will be. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I was uh, around to, to witness the, the picture of it taking off. Yeah, like what's, what's, your, what's your thoughts on spending so much time in bush planes, float planes, uh, beavers, otters, uh, everything up Norseman's? Um, you, did you ever think back in the day about an electric engine? Like, was it ever a thought? No, no. Uh, no, we were still using blow pots to heat the airplanes. We didn't even have an extension cord to put electric heater on them. We were, uh, electricity was there, but it was uh, in grandma's house. It wasn't really out there where we were trying to heat up airplanes. So no, electricity was never thought of as power in the airplane. I remember we got our first extension cord down in the ice. We were so happy to have, have uh, lights and an uh, old Herman Nelson to run. Before that, we used gas Hermans with little Briggs and Stratton engines in them to preheat the airplane. So this is a quite a, a movement through. And uh, now they like to heat the airplanes. We're we're heating the airplanes with blow pots. No, not a lot of people know what a blow pot is. So I better shut up. I'm aging myself <laughs> and start talking about blow pots to heat up airplanes. That's perfect, folks. You could you heard it there. That's awesome. Thank you for joining us. If you're new, of course, subscribe. Uh, if you just clicked on it because of the electric airplane. We're our restoring airplanes would be great uh, new new way to look back at old aviation or vintage aviation. So we'll see you in the next one. Have fun and wherever you are, stay warm. Number one tip for staying warm when it's this cold. The number one tip: big hat, thick hat, warm hat, clean underwear, and nice clean socks, thick socks. Thank you, folks. Well, what's up? This, this airplane, the AFL, is out of the 30s, but you see, since then, today, 
nothing has really changed. See that dog there? Civil aviation right there.